Welcome to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School, where we explore all kinds of things, stories about quilting, tools, field trips, maybe some famous quilters stop by, and of course, a little bit of copyright thrown in just for fun. This is Elizabeth Townsend Gard, your host, and I'm a law professor at Tulane University Law School and a faculty fellow at the A.B. Friedman School of Business at Tulane. And I just want to... So today we talk with A.J. Grossman. She is, um, she's really fun. She's part of the Quilting Army. She comments a lot on our Facebook group. And she's been in a lot of different interesting environments. And so we're going to talk about branding and all kinds of things, um in terms of her life well all right so i have a thousand questions for you but we're going to start with the really basic one which is tell me your name so what i thought we'd do is go through your life and your quilting and your your life as a professional and sort of where that's how that impacts i really love the comments you make on the facebook group they're always i'm always like yes 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 um so i really want to sort of help un- people understand sort of because you've you've worked in a professional you've worked in an artist environment you've worked in industry and profession in spaces where um uh, brands matter um you've just been around in a lot of different spaces so you understand sort of this context of intellectual property in a little bit different way so right, and i i actually had to go to court four times so each outcome was so different that I, I would love he, to talk about that. That's really you know, interesting. Yes, right. Yeah. Um, and dre- the dress code. Tell us more. And, well, and, and what, but we'll get that into that in just a second. We have to like do our first. Okay. We're getting ahead of ourselves. Right. I've told you. I'm really excited. And then I have um, this really. Um, first of all, it's seven o'clock, so central. It's eight o'clock here. <laughs> yeah, so um, I have a, these interviews tend to get a little more goofy because it's the end of the day. So we'll try and like, okay. keep on. Uh, and then I Don't worry it. about it. It's been a goofy week. We missed the hurricane. I know. Oh, I know. And one of my one of my dogs passed away the other day. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah, That's so a my lot. two beagles are gone. Just age, old age. But it's still a lot, and hurricanes are so yeah. stressful. I mean, they're so, so we still stressful. Have, we still have one more dog left, and he's really happy now being the only dog. <laughs> That's funny. <laughs> That's weird, right? <laughs> yeah, it is kind of weird, but he's finally like, yay, I'm the alpha dog, finally. <laughs> That's so funny. Okay, well, let's start with the easiest question, which I know the answer to. But tell me your name and where you're calling from. Okay, I am AJ Grossman, which is for Amelia Jean, but everybody calls me AJ. And I'm calling from Hollywood, Florida. Have they always called you AJ? Or was that something grown up when you were growing up? Grown, when no, you were grown actually, up? I changed it when I started to become more serious in my artwork because I needed to make my name gender neutral. Yeah. Because it gave better opportunities for me. Yeah. And did you find that to be the case? Stuck. Yeah, it was, yeah, because it took. It's very hard for women and women artists, and the quilting world is a little different. So when I transitioned and went into the quilting world, it kind of, the name just stuck. So those that are close to me really know what it stands for. So mostly when people go, what does it stand for? I go, Anthony Jr. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. I guess I'm really confused. (laughs) Right. And then I saw Angelina Jolie, and then they just tell them, that's the name. But Totally. Well, we we named our kid Sid. So that she would, and she's now uh, non-binary, goes by they, them pronouns, which I still struggle with because I'm a dork. Um, but again, we wanted to give her that opportunity that if she, uh, sort of gender, gender neutral name. Um, mm-hmm. And then I sent, once I sent out a paper under, instead of at Elizabeth, as East Townsend Guard, and it got a bet higher placement. See, you know. right. So is it, it's weird, like, how you name your child these days is really important. So yeah, right. Oh, wow. Yeah, and then the teenagers who are changing their names, I think that's okay. You know, I think that, that if they feel like struggling with their name, it's okay. It's your it's your body, it's your name, it's your it's you. So you get to decide. I mean, I feel like the name's temporary until you sort of decide who you are. Yeah, I mean, I very rarely use my legal name, and my nickname is really Amy, like family will call, but they just go AIM. So, but yeah. in like, but now everybody so knows me as AJ. I've been AJ for like fifteen years now. <laughs> Yeah. So I introduce people, and I kind of know now if I get a phone call of, okay, this is about art or quilting or professional, and then my, I run a small business, and then I use another name, and people go, why? And I go, well, first of all, I also like my privacy. Yeah. Because people go into finding out, oh, can I follow you here and follow you there? And, and I need to have the separation. Yeah, right. So you know who it is by the, what they call you. Yeah. That's but nobody ever calls me Mrs. Grossman. <laughs> 
<laughs> that's yeah i get that that's weird um so i you think know, it's is... like i guess it's generational I'm like nobody ever calls me mrs grossman i'm a i'm a nice married lady <laughs> Right? It doesn't happen. That's so yeah. funny. I think this is the longest conversation I've had about someone's name. <laughs> the first question. <laughs> We're like, all right, five minutes in. Um, okay. Uh, and tell me your first memory of someone sewing or quilting in your life. Um, my dad was in the garment center, so I was always around sewing machines. And my mom was a quilter. Um, so I was always been around, like, the fabric trade and sewing mm -hmm. machines like that. Um, but my mom was left-handed. Really? So she teach me how to knit or crochet because everything's reverse. But she taught me how to cut out everything because in her day, you had to cut everything out with like a little template and then cut on the lines. And scissors were only right-handed. So I'm right-handed. So I basically became her cutter. Oh, I like <laughs> so that. So that's probably what led me into fashion because, you know, pattern making and stuff. But that was really what I did. And the only other thing she can teach me was how to do embroidery because the stitches wouldn't be backwards. Yeah. So that was my first experience. But I was in the garment center, so I've always been like what they call like the needle trade. That's it's really just, cool. Yeah. And very interesting. And you went to art school. So tell me a little bit about, did you go to FIT? Actually, I didn't go to art school at the beginning. I'm the first woman in my family to go to college. So in cool. my family, you had to be, of course, a doctor or, or a lawyer. Uh -huh. so my parents had really high hopes for me to not be in the needle trade or the fashion business. They wanted me to have a profession. So I graduated high school at 16 and wow. my the college of my mother's choice. And when I graduated, I really, really wanted to go into fashion. So my parents made a deal with me that I can go to FIT at night if I got my master's degree during the day. So I'm actually a chemical engineer by education. Really? I don't have that fashion design degree. Really? How yeah. interesting. And so I am responsible for your acid wash jeans that you probably wore in the 80s. Really? Are you yeah, famous? well, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then I ended up getting, I had this ability to draw, uh -huh. but my mom was just not, she just didn't want me to go into the art. She was afraid that I wouldn't make a to support myself. Right, so, every mother should worry about that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just kidding, so I have an art kid. Fashion Institute, fashion like, Institute you know. is part of the State University yeah. of New York. Yeah. So because I, I'm from New York City, my I was just able to complete my class, and I just loved it. And my dad, of course, being the garment center, wanted me to do it. But, you know, my mother was like, no, no, no. This is like, she needs to have a profession and, um, you know, very women's live and she needs to earn a living and she can do and she can paint and do all of her art on the weekends. Yeah. So go know that all these years later, all my education, what I have, like, it kind of comes together. Yeah. Um, you know, I ended up running a fashion company and a dye house and now I own a skincare business. So, all of that chemical side. Right, that was what I was going to ask. And how, and how you work and how you set things up. But my education at, at Fashion Institute was tremendous. And my career before, I had this, I was a retail and a hotel, wholesale executive for years. So, but um, the one thing about the Fashion Institute, it's kind of like Project Runway. So they give you like a challenge and you have to learn every step of the way to completion. And you don't really learn that in, in a lot of colleges. You just learn one skill or get this body of knowledge whereas FIT really I don't know in the class that I took um the courses that I took um they really took taught you how to take a concept from conceptual all the way to production I love it, it has helped me in my processes in everything I've done so and I loved every minute of it <laughs> that's really cool okay so yeah. you Obviously, your chemical engineering came in hugely handy, as you said, and also kind of the artwork that you do. It's got a kind of, like when I look at it, like it's got kind of a chemical-y aspect to it, right? Like the kind of, you know, it's not, you're doing more than just, your stuff is, your stuff is incredibly cool, by the way. Like I just beyond I, I, I love your a, stuff. I but. paint, thank you. I paint with a blowtorch, so I yeah. use a process called encaustic, which is made out of beeswax. You have to melt it down. Um, but all painting, because I came from originally oil painting, it's all chemical mixing. Right. And so all those kind of things kind of come into play. Um, and a lot of my encaustic artist friends, which I hate to use the word encaustic artist, we're all artists. It's just that encaustic is the medium. Yeah. So many of them from textile backgrounds because you can mix the wax with the textiles. And I've met so many people who are quilters that incorporate it with their encaustic wax because the fabric just loves to soak up the wax. Interesting 
um, journey when I run into so many artists that their backgrounds are textiles. So interesting. Medium. So right. it's, it's kind of cool. It's very um, cool. I love your stuff. Um, can we talk a little bit about your um, your series, the climate change series? Because they're so pretty and they're so – it's you. so kind of like what's happening. I mean, for those listening or for people listening later, um, you've been – I've been watching you on Facebook – wading out this hurricane that is just keeps sitting places and is terrifying and um it's not it's it seems like it's not going to get you guys we had one of those we evacuated for one that didn't hit our just a few weeks ago um it's yeah. i don't think people i mean if you haven't been through it it just it, it is so like the stress of yeah. if it's coming is like people don't really under it, it's just i grew up in earthquake territory it just happened this one you kind of it's brutal right and yeah. so you've got the, I mean, this beautiful series was, of material he's yeah. a i've been here since hurricane andrew so andrew was what changed the face of florida with how they build but two years ago when irma was coming and that was going to be a cat five and cover the whole the whole state, i remember that right my, my kids my sister called me and said what's worse than a category five and i said nothing it's total devastation and i looked at my husband and we at that point we couldn't evacuate because we would they, people didn't know where to go right but we hybrid vehicles that can go 600 miles on a tank of gas and we basically said okay we know that the house will survive the storm most likely but everything would be devastated so we basically packed the cars and with I what know this. we need that we knew we were going to drive out of florida and probably never come back right i've done so, this right. three times this right. is terrible so, so yeah. knowing that i was going to leave leave my art studio leave my business leave my home so when I, so that, that spurred that series. So what was happening, I really realized that South Florida is ground zero for climate change. We have rising sea level. We have rising groundwater. The storms are getting bigger. We have algae bloom on the West Coast. I mean, it is, if it, it's, you know, I know like up north they go, well, it's colder and all these things. But if you really want to see what climate change or global warming or any of whatever you want to call it, South Florida is really ground zero because we get affected by every everything that happens. Yeah. Even the beautiful clear waters and all this. So that's where that series came about. And I started just, I was so stressed after, after Irma that I kind of changed my color palette. And I kind of, they don't, the pictures, yeah, when you see them in person, they're like 50 layers of wax. So the wow. photograph, you can't really see them. That's but they're craziness. all. And they all beeswax gets polished to a high shine. So I started really working on this whole thing with um, climate change. So a lot of my artwork now coming from like commercial artists where, yeah, I had to design stuff for, you know, people to wear. Uh -huh. My art was a little bit more political, a little yeah. bit more had a series on, um, on uh, gun violence. And after I finished that series, we had Parkland that happened down wow. here. And, you know, we just, <laughs> we're like ground zero for everything. Everything, down here. right. So all of those things tend to influence. And like now I'm working on quilts that kind of reflect some of my art, old artwork that was a lot more with geometrics and squares. And I haven't posted them yet. I'm debating, do I put my quilt work on my my current art website or do I do a separate one and keep them separate? I'm kind of like, you know, it's a lot to handle two separate Oh, it's things. too much. Yeah, it's a pain. It's, it's kind pain. of figuring that out. Right. So, um, so that's where that came from to really make awareness because People just, I mean, today it's September and normally we start cooling down and today it was almost 100 degrees. Oh, I know, it's terrible, right? I'm sure that was from the hurricane, but, um, you know, every every storm now is like, they're not just a one or a two. I still have my hurricane shutters up. I'm like, okay, something else is brewing. Do I take them down? Yeah. Do I'm stocked still up in enough? The, um, is going to interrupt my business? Yeah. You know. Well, we know sort of. So we always joke that we, we, we are very bad about going to the grocery store, but we do eventually. And we always are like, well, now we're going to have to evacuate because we've now bought so much food. Like, we've finally gone. Right. There's a sense of like... And all my water, my food, my hurricane shows up. There's no storm. Exactly. <laughs> it was my business. Exactly. Whatever. It's so crazy. It is a terrible feeling to pack whatever you can in your car, your pets, your 
precious things and hope, you know, just drive away. And like hope is there, you know? The only good thing is, is that I always tell my husband, I need to have a manual sewing machine because last time I was lucky when Irma came, I didn't lose my power. So I quilted a lot. <laughs> That's <laughs> right. So it was really good. And I'm like, we need to have like an old fashioned with the treadle. Oh, the treadle. Exactly. Like that. Right. So I have, exactly. I have one at my mother-in-law's house, like an old treadle featherweight. That's those, fabulous. Yeah. Because like, I have no power at least. I could still quilt. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly it. Oh, okay. So, um, tell me, so you went to, so you finished your, your degree, your, your two degrees, your art degree and your science degree. And then what happened to you? What did, where did you go after that? Let's go back to that. And so, um, I'm from New York city. I'm born and raised in Manhattan. I'm a true Manhattanite. That's my Manhattan accent. So my dad was in the garment center, but I didn't want anybody to know who he was because everybody knew who he was. So I put together a portfolio and I used my mother's maiden name and I went out on job interviews. <laughs> and my first job interview was as an illustrator for Cheryl Teagues. Remember the big uh-huh. supermarket? Yeah. So it was before the time of, there wasn't like the pro, there was no computer program. So everything was drawn by hand. And I'm able to draw like anything. You can show me the fabric. I can duplicate it. I can copy it. So when you go into the fashion houses, they make these big storyboards and they would be hand painted. And basically that's what I did for like the first six months. I made all the storyboards and the designer then left. And basically the merchandise manager said, well, I guess you're the new designer now. <laughs> that's really cool. And I worked with, all the companies that we work with now for quilting, um, Miller and Henry Glass and all those companies I worked with because they printed all of our fabrics to make our cloth. So I worked with all their designers and that's where I first pretty much learned. You say in the fashion industry, we have a term we call, we make a knockoff. We copy. Right, all right. Time. You copy from really high level. That's right. Like, tour and you bring it down to your level. Right. So I work with all the textile artists and I would say well I want this hibiscus flower and they go well we can't copy it exact so we have to change this one and make this a little smaller and we'll make this one bigger so whenever I look at the old Sears catalog and I look at Cheryl Teagues and I look at all the florals I did they're not a a botanist would say they're not correct because Uh I would like a peony leaf and stick it on because you have to change it so right. you, you were get changing it enough that people right. wouldn't say you were, there wasn't like, copyright well, infringement that's not a cabbage rose that's a hybrid cabbage rose <laughs> start changing things and because you're shopping all the time and back then there wasn't that much on copyright and infringement it wasn't as big because a lot of the things we were doing we were knocking off things in europe but the fabric companies were really good because if let's say uh, like dots and stripes you can't copyright but let's say the cabbage rose for example is the hot flower they're going to say well we can't do that one because we're doing that for abc company and we're doing a similar one for xyz company so we're going to have to make yours like this so they kind of knew everything that was going on but you still want to be on trend so that's when i really got into well what's 10 percent? well 10 percent you really can't see but you know it's kind of like well if i change the colors and i change the scale the size yeah. then it's really derivative and then yeah. i'm a and then nobody really owns a cabbage rose, but right. you never know. You were always no, being aware of. And I imagine that it was an industry standard that you all wanted to make sure it was different enough. Like it was, everybody needed to respect each other. It was a, it's, it's a, co- I mean, it isn't like, there's no copyright measurements. Like you're not going to like some like third party that's like, yes, you've reached 10% or yes, you've reached 20%. <laughs> um, right. But that the system has to operate in a way that works for that system. And so right. um, you get to se- sense of how much you need to change it because of custom. Right. But then yeah. when I went to my next big design job, I, well, I, we did get sued at Cheryl Teague's um, on the Cabbage Rose. You did. You about that. <laughs> Um, and then, but my next job, I went into jeans wear and everything was about, you can't make it look like a Levi's pocket because Levi's is actually patented. Yes. And they sued and they won. So that's a trademark case we teach in our classes. And we also teach a a thing on knockoffs. Yes. These are, yes. yes. So so like the alligator from Lacoste. Like, so when I got in the industry, it was basically like every company, whatever part of apparel they did, they were like, okay. Here, you're going to sit with our IP attorney or, you know, here's the book and yeah. this can't do. And so cool. I had this education that I didn't really realize, like, 
from copyright to trademark, you know, like 23, I think is Michael Jordan. You can never put the number 23. I mean, this is 30 years ago. Right. Dale, like number three, you can never use the number three with a sports car. Um, every word is sometimes copyrighted. Like I, I own a lash studio and somebody trademarked the word lash, but she doesn't enforce it. Uh-huh. So kind of like, well, that you spent a lot of money for something you don't enforce. Right. But two, but, but I had been sued four times and each outcome was so different. Right, of how so tell me a little bit more about what, so tell, help us understand what that is, what, what happened and how we can learn so, from your stuff. So the very first one, I was still at the Cheryl Teeves Company. It was the era of the Cabbage Rose, and everybody wore these hand-knit sweaters. It was the 80s with a rose in the middle or some sort of flower, and then the pullout would be a jean or a skirt that had the flower all over it. So Adrian Vitadini, I'm allowed to say her name in this suit, um, she was known for these hand-knit sweaters with the matching um, pull-out print for the bottom. And she sold in, like, Saks and Bloomingdale's and those stores. So I had bought the sweater, I believe, in somewhere in Paris. Um, one of the things I had learned, and all the fashion houses do it, is documentation and archiving your work. So I would come back from Europe with bags of clothing, and we would go through everything, and we would send out the garments to a company, and they would make life-size photographs. And then we would do this horrible thing, and we would cut the garments in half. <laughs> we would damage them. So all garments that you bring in from out of the country have to be damaged, otherwise you pay duty. So I would sit there and cut up these, you know, things I just spent $500 on. So we would cut them up and we would send them out to our factories to reproduce. And we would put directions on, change this color, make this rose bigger, all these kind of things. Right. So we would get it of when we got it. We would put the ticket on where we purchased it, any information. So this way, if something was a very big seller, maybe we want to go back in two years and revisit something. So we had archives, and all the fabric companies have archives of all of their work as well. So we get a letter, and it's a cease and desist letter. It always starts with the letter cease and desist. So Adrian Vitadini had shipped in her garment into the stores, and mine, I believe, was either at Sears or J.C.'s Pennies at the same time. Now, that means that somebody at her company probably found it, was shopping in their local mall, saw it, and all garments have an RN number, a registration number. So they obviously looked up the number, and up pops my company. So the attorneys go gather all the information, everything, because we're going to defend this in court. It's all about money. Right. All they want is profit, right? right? So we go into court. You know, I'm a big, like, 23 years old. And, and you know, I showed the judge that I went to Europe. I bought the sweater. Here's my documentation. Here's the date I, I did it. Here's my initial sketch. It's still slightly different. But she's coming after me. She produces the same sweater. Wow. She bought the same sweater Love that it, I did. Right? And we pretty much copied exactly the same that sweater. That is me. so great. So what is, and that's right. like, right, that's like, that's right. like, this, that's a classic thing we teach, right. right? And here it is. It's like, yes, I was in Galleries Lafayette in April and I bought it and she was in Galleries Lafayette. So, okay, we copied the same sweater. And this case is dismissed because it's just simultaneous right. and it was right. no, she didn't, she didn't own it, creation. and I didn't own it. That's right. That was it. That's interesting. Six or eight months later, maybe even like a year later, and she keeps producing those sweater sets and everything. I'm still at the company. And we decide that we're going to produce another one of these. And I go back and I go, well, there was another sweater that I had, and we never produced it. It didn't make the line, um, whatever. So I show it to the bar, and she goes, I love it. And we produce it. But Adrian Vitadini had produced and oh. shipped Six months before. Right. So now I get the same letter. Yeah. Susan, and we figured, slam dunk. We already we already did this. Right. Same judge and precedent wasn't applicable. So we go back into court and we show the same thing. I purchased this on this date. But because hers had shipped. That's right. Access. Right. Um, prior. I could have just. It, it, they right. didn't. You know, I bought the sweater a year ago. Yeah. It's because, you know, there's like a six months fashion That's it was like no go so even though i had the original proof and i had already won one case they said sorry no deal because maybe i went into the store and saw That's well right. when That's i'm right. gonna put that on it didn't matter That's exactly and right. even That's though right. her stuff isn't officially copyrighted yeah it's just, it's just still no so that case we had to settle you know yeah. we had to write the check yeah. And but you never know. But we right. decided to defend it. That was my first thing. After after that company, I went to the jeans for company and um, you know, we got a lesson on like I spoke to you earlier right. about don't do it right. A pocket that looks like this. <laughs> that's right. But 
luckily the company I worked for, Gatano Jeans at the time, we had our own in-house counsel. We had everything. So everything we designed, every word we picked, anytime it was adopted to the line, it would go through legal to yeah. make sure I could come back and say, you can't do this. You have to tweak that and all that. So right. big enough company that we knew we'd get targeted. So, so I, I'm going to ask you a question. How was that to live under? Did you like having the attorney to be able to double check after your first experience or was it, did you find it um, in, like income, like too much? Like, did it keep no, you? No, I, I didn't at all. I was, I always, I started my career at the time when they was, these were big corporations with, we, we had in-house advertising, we had in-house counsel, and I looked at it as just part of doing business. Yeah. Um, it was the start of, you know, Nike with the swoosh and, you know, branding was becoming a like big a thing. You know, yeah, you, you, you were. Know, it wasn't the thing. internet. I was just right. at the forefront of Very developing cool. this brand. So, you know, of course, when Gatano came out, we had the four bars. Well, Adidas has three bars, you know, so we were really cautious to make sure that what we did, we had our own identity and our own brand. Um, but, you know, a lot of times the buying office would come to you and they go, oh, I bought this at the Gap and I want something like this. And we would be like, oh, uh, well, you know, so I remember there at the Gap, they had these kids shirts that had like glitter transfers with a lot of like puppy dog, like photography work. Uh-huh. So anything they would adopt, we would have to buy the licensee for the photograph. And then when you buy a licensee from the photograph, you also have to pay for how much are you going to use of it. So if I was using it on 500 shirts, it's one fee. If I was using it on 5,000 shirts, it's another fee. Right. So that was a whole, and then, you know, that affected my cost because I didn't know that, well, if the distribution is at one level and the distribution is at another, there's the royalty cost is very different. So, you know, then we say, do we hire our own photographer? Do we use royalty free? But in the end, it was just still just better to work with the companies and buy the photographs. Um, and we would just work it out with the buying office that we were working with to say, you know, do you want to buy the uh, the the, cop, the, the um, royalties for this photograph of a puppy dog or do you want us to do it? Um, because they may want to reproduce it later on and I may not right. be the vendor that has it. Right. So a lot of times we would say like to the Kmart or the Sears, you know, you're going to be buying that artwork or that photograph, and then you can use it for whatever you need to, because, you know, I, I didn't want to have any more liability after right. that. Right, that makes a lot of sense. Well, that was a whole other learning experience. Yeah. When I ended up living half my life in, in Hong Kong and half in New York, and um, Hong Kong was going to go back to the, com the communist, and in 1994, a lot of people were leaving, and I decided to leave as well, and that's why I ended up in Florida, working for another fashion company, um, so I left New York and, you know, it was just time for a change and, um, what's better than living in sunny Florida. And I work for a company, mid-sized company, and I am pretty much more like the art director. And, um, we made everything from children's wear to private label to maternity, you name it. We made everything very heavy in screen printing, um, cause we own screen printing factories. Um, so, um, we got uh, sued on that company um, by a private individual who's one of these famous guys who do either, I don't remember if it was BMX or skateboarding. He, I never even heard of this person. But we had done a line of boys where, and usually we work with the buying office and they go, you know, skateboarding's really hot and I want t-shirts that reflect skateboarding and whatever the themes are. You work a lot with the buying offices when you're at the mass merchant level. So we did a, you know, a, a a grouping, we purchase it, we produce it, and we get a cease and desist letter. And I am like baffled because I have no clue of who this person is. I can't even remember his name, but he's somebody famous in like the BMX world. So we investigate, we call their people, we find out. And, and it turns out that a child got a gift of a shirt from his grandmother, assumed it to be this particular celebrity skateboarder, sent it to him and said, can you autograph your shirt that my grandma bought me? Interesting. <laughs> so we were like, what? <laughs> like, so the IP attorney comes in and he says, pull your sketches. And once again, since I had really good training, all of my artists, whatever we did, we always kept everything on file. And anytime something was adapted to the line, all the sketches, even if it was on a napkin, would go into the folder. Yeah. Even anything that was in the computer got printed out. And we yeah. always put it on the envelope C for copyright and the date, because if we had to file it later, 
you can just file it. So right. even so if you didn't file, you didn't file copyright on the st- on the designs or anything because no. pa- because fabric isn't protectable by copyright, but aesthetic aesthetic uh, separability is. And you were just yes. going to wait and then do a fast track to copy to right. get a copyright registration if something okay. arose because it didn't make sense to do it other ways. No, it would be cost prohibitive too. Yeah, and it's funny because we've talked to Jaftex and they said the same thing, and they come from a fabric industry like your background so i think it's got to be part you know what i mean they're not they're not doing they're waiting again to see if there's a problem because they have so many lines there's no reason yeah, it's to just do would that. be impossible yeah so we pull the file and i go to my artist and i said show me where you got this and it was a silhouette i remember it was a black outline a silhouette on like a guy on his bmx bike, like in the air and i'm trying to remember the name of the guy and i just can't remember so they show me it. And I said, show me what you did. And they go, well, we got, we went to Barnes and Nobles or Borders and we bought magazines and it wasn't anybody famous. And we scanned them into the computer. We basically outlined it. We used a program called Freehand at the time and they had a trace thing um, modality and they just traced it in, but they show me the original picture and it's just stock photography. So we decide that we're going to go to court. We're not going to settle. They ask for a dollar amount, but we decide no, because we, this we don't there's no way we, we're producing the original artwork and let me ask you a question so because they 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 traced the stock photography it wasn't the stock photographer like if the stock photographer had come and been upset with you guys that would have been a different story because you could have been like oh sorry we should have licensed it from you you know whether it was you know but right. it's not the person the person suing wasn't the, about the photograph so no, that's why you're person, like right. right so that's It isn't that you can just trace any picture you want. Just in case people are out there, it's not about like, oh, you can just trace anything as long as they're not famous. It was that that was the person. Right, right. It's actually an important word, which will come up in my next. next. All right. So So tell us. So what? So you said. So you go to court. So we go to court, and you know we already have produced it, shipped it. We have what what it was, and we show them that we took a photograph, we outlined it, and we just like little adjustments. Yeah. But saying that this is his signature pose. I have no clue, but we show them, well, we lose the case. And we lose the case because the perception of the consumer, right. this person, right. and that's all that mattered. Right. All that mattered. Right. So I had to write a check of my profit and anything extra. I had to show that, like, I destroyed it, which we didn't have anything. But that was just a fluke, all because, oh. a, a, a you know, a kid sent the shirt to that wow. celebrity, got to him, and... And, and I know a lot of people now have people that actually scout through the internet and places yeah. looking, people are copying them. And we really thought that we we had won that because yeah. it was like, no, and I, like I said, I can't even remember the guy's name, right. but it was, I wouldn't know. That's really and, interesting. Cause it was his right, of, it was his, like his thing, his right of publicity. What was what he was known for is his economic, that pose was his, it's the Vanna White case. There's a Vanna, Vanna uh, a, f- a funny case where um, someone's making a joke about, you know, in 2012, this is in the 90, 90s, 2012, Vanna White's going to be replaced by a robot turning the letters. And they nobody <laughs> they don't think it's funny. And um, Vanna White sues. And they say, yeah, just the Im- like conjuring her up in that way was a violation of a right of publicity. Which, wow, yeah. Know, yeah, so it's that same era, well, yeah. right? Yeah, I, I, I there's other that. cases that come later that go, no, it was funny. You went too far. But I think probably when you were sort of this is happening, that concept of like the economic value of somebody's brand, it, we're in that early age of like thinking about what that is. So I could see that happening with your case, yeah. you know. So but we, you know, we had we had kind of said like, well, then you also need to go after the photographer because you know you're right. producing. What we also did was we had so many. We did our research. One of the things the IP attorney was like, I needed to find other photographs of not him yeah. that have was that I could have pose, right? That it's to generic. show like, well, you, right. right. But it didn't matter. It was all because the, it's, it's the consumer the, perception. Consumer. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that's, that's all what, what branding is and trademark and trade dress and right of publicity and all those yep. things that protect yeah. it is it's protecting our, our feelings about something. It's a very ephemeral, weird thing that trademark protects. Right. Yeah. Right. That the kid, so, yeah. the kid that so, kid, that kid's perception matters. Yeah, yeah. The, the Whether you have a property right <laughs> in pose, right? Yeah, Weird. right. But go now. So, and okay. then um, the same company, of course, you know, the buyers are always insisting. So um, I was a big Kmart vendor and Joe Boxer was their big, huge 
um, thing in the early 90s. Mm -hmm. It was the big face. Well, you know, they want to do their version of it. We're like, you can't. That's impossible. There's like no way. So they decide that the next thing that would be popular was the Paul Frank monkey. So I don't know if you remember it. It was this very graphic looking monkey and it was it was on like every kid wore it. It looked like a sock puppet monkey. Oh, yeah, yeah. Uh-huh. So it's called the Paul Frank monkey. So they decide that um, they want to have their version of it. So now being the art director, I have to be creative because it's a big account of mine. And a lot of times what they do in the buying offices or these companies is they'll pitch these ideas to a few companies. So everybody's working on it. So you're competing. So I decide I buy all the stuff from Paul Frank. I buy the books, whatever. And I see like, he has a menagerie and we kind of get his style. And I work with the team and I said, you know what? Every animal he has, we're going to do an animal he doesn't have. So he had a crab and I think he had a turtle and he had the monkey and he had a giraffe. So anything he had, we're not going to touch. We're going to do everything he doesn't have. So I start sketching because I can sketch because for whatever reason, (laughs) none of my artists wanted to take it. And I start sketching other animals and we make the presentation to the buyer and the buyer picks um, the zebra. So it was a black and white zebra and the stripes spelled out zebra. We figured no problem. He doesn't have a zebra. We're good to go. So I had the, I was fortunate that every Sunday the Kmart circular would come out in the Sunday paper and I always got the front page. So the next week, my, whatever the order comes and I go, Oh, look, there I am on the front. There's my zebra. But next to it is another model wearing a crab. That's almost identical to Paul Frank Crab. We don't worry about it because we didn't do it. Yeah. A cease and desist order for both of them. Well, I didn't do the crab. So we decide we're going to answer the letter. That's another thing. Don't always answer the letters so quick. We answer the letter and we tell them we're only responsible for the zebra. And we don't, we're not responsible for the crab. We know who did the crab. So we contact that company and say, listen, what are you going to do? And they say, well, you already answered it. We're not going to do anything. You're, you're on the hook. We're like, what? No, we're not going to answer the letter. You already answered the letter. So we decide we're going to go to court because if we're going to be responsible for anything, we're only going to be responsible for the zebra. Right. I pull all the sketching, oh, pull everything. Gosh. We're going to go to court. Yeah. And we go to court and they decide not to have me in the courtroom. They're going to have one of my artists in the courtroom. So we decide to take one of my artists who was really the one that did everything on. Basically he traced my, my sketches, but he used the word, two things happened. He used the word trace, which the judge did not like because trace means like copy. And the other thing we ended up losing the case, even though we showed him that there was no zebra and now zebra was kind of in the style, but you really can see it was so different. But it was also because of the fact we ended up having to pay damages for the crab as well as wow, the zebra. Really? Which we counter to the other company. Yeah. yeah. Once again, it was the perception that the the ad that was running had them two together. Yeah. And there was almost an, an identical knockoff. Wow. So because so they, they messed it, you up because they they didn't recognize. Did they say that it was too substantially similar to his style to Was it because of the crab or was it because you were so close to what he was doing? We were, ours wasn't that close. So when my artist went in, we were trying to coach him on what to say and what not to say. Yeah. In one of the other ones, when we had used the word trace, I remember the judge kept saying, you traced it. And we said, oh no, it's, it's this part of the program and it helps us make a vector image. So he had explained that I had sketched everything out and we had decided, and then he had, Traced with tracing paper. The word trace is just not a word that you use when you're defending when you have copyright infringement. Right. But either way, it went back to. But he was tracing your stuff, not the original tracing artist. My stuff, that's but the part I, that's I, weird, you know? Right. But I really think what it was was because of the fact that the other company wasn't coming forward. We had, it, we, it was also, once again, the perception was if you, if you, if I showed you the ad, and a consumer saw the right. ad. It's a perception. They, right. It's a trade dress. Say, oh, right. Right. they have it's Paul all. Frank now. That's right. That's right. That and it. they're doing and it on perception. And then we had a counter to the other That's company. Right. That's right. Because, yeah. So we learned, like, don't answer letters so quickly. Wait for the second letter. <laughs> 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 that one costs a lot. <laughs> and then, but at the end of the day, all the copyright, like when I'm in the Facebook group and people say, <laughs> this and I did that. 
the thing is, if you're making it for your personal use right. and you're making a quilt, that's right. for your personal Nobody use, cares. enjoy it. Right? But if you're taking something and you're really right. going to reproduce it for a business and you know that you took it from somewhere else, because usually if you're questioning it already, well, this looks kind of similar and this looks kind right. of that. Then it's you not can- independent creation. If you're like, hey, I have this thing and I want to make it and look exactly the same, yeah. like don't make yeah. it look exactly the same. <laughs> like do right. something like make else. Make your nine patch a quarter of an inch bigger. Right. No, it's not. That's not going to be good that enough. You can't do. No. But then there are people that'll say, like, there's somebody now, like about some Ralph Lauren. Oh, that was craziness, right? That one. Right. But that one got was, me today. I think she was producing it to be in a book that she was going to sell the book of her work, and I'm like, well, then you're okay. Right. That's like a whole different thing. Like, it is, yeah. That's a deal. Right. But in I, that situation, she was taking vintage vintage Ralph Lauren fabric, and she wanted to know if she could make it. I don't remember what it was, but it wasn't. It was a purse or something, right? Yeah, but the question is like, and then she wanted to sell it, and it was like, well, no. Like, right? Like, there's a perception. Like, are people going to perceive it as being a Ralph Lauren product? Then don't do it. Like, if you're right. going to use it in a quilt and you're, or you're commenting, criticizing in some way, or you're making it for your grandkid – that's totally different, but you know yeah. these companies. This is their bread and butter. Like, yeah, they you know, go after people. Yeah, yeah. And, and they need to. They have to police their mark, right? That's part of the job. I mean, it's not that they're mean and they're evil. It's that if they don't, they lose their mark. So right. you know, like you know, it, and it's complicated. As your stories say, trademark and trade dress and copyright are all and right of publicity. All those stories yeah. had those in it. They're all super complicated, and and it really is. It you know, Cheryl Sloboda gets mad at me because I always say it depends, and it's like, well, yeah, but it does. <laughs> you know, like but it you also know. depends. Like if you have deep enough pockets, like when I went to start my business, we were debating if I should trademark the name. So the trademark attorney said, well, so many people have the name Lash, and so many people have this, and then you'd have to do it in all these categories, yeah. and it would thousand dollars. And then at the end of the day, I said, like, there's a girl now in my community. I'm the Lash Lady, and she's Lady Lash, yeah. and I'm all of her phone calls. So I called her. She goes, but we're not the same. I go, but you're running a Groupon and the perception is that it's me. Yeah, right. Remember. And so I said to her, I wish you the best of luck, but your price point is so low and your work isn't of my level that, you did know, you somebody have... comes to you assuming it's me. Yeah. Did so you have, did you have the trademark on? Were you able to? We never trademarked it because what you we said. decided was yeah. That I said, most of the people in my industry are solo solo practitioners. Yeah. They don't really have any money. Yeah. So I'm doing for something that yeah. I don't want another small business woman out of yeah. business. But when I explained it to her, she really didn't get it. Yeah. And she said to me, well, what if I lash better than you? And yeah. I said, then I'll power to you. <laughs> like, right. But she couldn't understand it. But she knew that I existed. Yeah. She said, you, you're really popular. You're like the first one here. So I reversed the name. And. I said, but that's the, that's the point, right? That's point. exactly she the point. She, she wasn't getting had, it. And, right. and if you had had and, the trademark. And I said to her, but I want right. you to know that I'm getting your phone calls. And what's happening is yeah. people are saying, I'm running an ad in a Groupon. And I'm like, no, I'm not. And then they're arguing with me. Right. I'm like, this is who you want. Here's right. a phone number. Call her. Yeah. But I said, you see, they're getting confused. Yeah. And could I go after her? Absolutely. Because right. I have deep pockets. Right. Is it worth my time? No. no. So all things at the end of the day there are some companies that like the dapper dan thing like why didn't gucci and all these companies go after him when he was knocking off their logos because they just said well we're so hoity-toity and he's doing everything in you know new york at the you know in the urban markets so low that they didn't care that he was knocking off their his the logo would actually their brand eventually yeah. it's complicated so it isn't just it? depends yeah. it just depends and some companies will will go after yeah um you know, would I put a Nike swish on my quilt? Absolutely not. <laughs> but, you know, some people I see the questions, I go, oh, I bought Star Wars fabric. Yeah. And now I'm a quilt and I'm going to put it to auction. I'm like, that's okay. That's because totally when, fine, that, right? That's how you bought program, the licensing. Yeah, right. Exactly. Like, that's you okay. bought the fabric. You bought the fabric. Right. They don't, yeah. So I think a lot is just that. Yeah. But even now, like, I'm the president of my quilt guild. And we always have this conversation of derivative and what's original. And I yeah. said, you know, there's a few things like if you make a quilt in a in a um, in a workshop, maybe you shouldn't enter that into into a competition because you were really assisted with that. 
Or if you think something and you're copying somebody's quote for personal use, but sometimes like, well, I'm going to copy it. I want to enter it. I'm like, but that's not ethical. Like, you know, yeah, I mean, I think that, I mean, you know, my feeling, I've been doing a ton of work on this, 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 I'm like obsessed with this, emo- this in the moment because, you know, I've been looking at the, at, at the cases, I've been looking at the compendium of the copyright office and really trying to understand how the system works, right? When, and you've been in the midst of it. So this is, see what you think about this theory. So first you've got the original work. If mm-hmm. I take a class and I and I take that pattern or I buy that pattern and I make my own version, I'm not making a derivative work just because I choose pink instead of blue. That's not the way the copyright law works. It's not protecting my – it's giving me a non-exclusive license to make a version of the pattern. That's what they're giving me to do. Now whether it's how far that license goes is, is you know, up for debate. So when does a derivative work – how, when is a derivative work created? And you were doing that in your career, right? You were changing it enough. You were taking something that was uh, in the public domain, a flower, and then you were trying to sort of make it different, right? And what we see is that for the derivative definition, it's recast, transform, and there's another part. It's too late in the day for me to remember everything. <laughs> um, but it has to be different enough that the courts can tell the difference between the two. And it, just changing the colors, that's not enough. That's just not enough. Like, again. We're changing you know the I mean? scale and keeping the same the scale, color. It's not right. enough. Right. And it has think, to be, right. Yeah. And most of the time, we're not going to go to court over, I mean, so I want to have a copy, a, a property right in the fact that I made it green. Like, that's just a really weird way to think about it. And that it would last my life plus 70 years and I'm going to keep you from, I mean, the whole thing doesn't make any sense. So then the other side of it is the last part of it. So most works are original. You get original works. Most of the stuff we don't, we do doesn't rise to being a derivative work. It's, it's just we had a license to make that pattern. Sometimes it is a derivative work. And then the third one is a transformative work where you're taking something and you're recasting it, ret- remaking it, using fair use, commenting, criticizing the artwork that you do, right? The things that you do as an artist um, may incorporate copyrighted works, and that's very different. than. Yeah. And so I think it's okay to, enter, to take a class and enter – uh, you know, take a Sue Blyweiss class and enter, or take or, or make her book, but give her credit, right? Say I did it this right, thing. That's a whole different right? thing. And it's fine. And don't try to sell it, right? Like that's not yours to sell. Um, she's, right. you know, she's given you the right to make it, um, but that right to sell it is still hers. So I, I just think this obsession with, I mean, every single person wants to know if they can sell stuff, and it's like. I'm really curious. Are they making any money? Like the whole thing is so <laughs> weird to me. Like just in, like it is. You know, I think if I, a pressure if I owned itself, a quilt, you know? if I owned a quilt business and I was a quilter and I had a certain look, yeah, and I'm developing a look, and all of a sudden I see people doing using it? like I'm on fabric and I have a certain look. I see people doing it, and I'm yeah. thinking, like Denise Schmidt, she's yeah. known for that wedding wedding ring. Yeah, that's no, that's hers. If I make one for myself, that's fine. But the thing is, it's like. You know, she made that. That's she. That's her right. thing. You should go after people. Okay, that are- so here's the problem, though. Here's this is my okay. This is my whole life right now. So let's go back to Sue because I totally love her stuff. Her stuff is for those who don't know it are very are they black lines and they're very mm-hmm. they're very distinct. You can see them from across. Like if you go to a show, you see them. But she yeah. made a book. So she right. and she also taught us. Like it, it, we were in a festival. She came to our booth and she taught us how to make them, which was so great. But she doesn't have a lock on that, on the technique or the look or any of those things. So, and I think that by making a book, you're opening yourself up to, you have to expect expect that other people are now going to make your things and that it's going to, like you've given them an applied license to make them, enter them into a show. I mean, you've showed them how to do it. So I don't know how to think about that because I don't think she could, I think I can make one of those. And it, yeah, it would be okay, with her you know? But like in the art world, I took a class once and the teacher was explaining and she put the pictures on the one. They were like war halls and like famous art right. and all lawsuits. And she goes, was this derivative or right. not? And we were wrong on every single one because right. it came to the fact of not only first usage, but when it went to court, That's right. it was about That's right. who, it, perception. Exactly. It goes back to that. So then, so, you, then you're right. at it. So, so like, great. So this is my, this, my head hurts from all of this, right? So, could, so yeah. let's say somebody, let's go back to Sue. So let's say I say, I, I like this style. I like this idea. 
I'm going to make my own version. It's a technique. It's not hers. She can't keep people from doing it. But then she sues She does all the buildings a lot. Right, right? exactly. Right, 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 right. And then she sues. And then, do it in boots. Right. And it turns out I get a big contract with Joanne's. And they've right. put, and then she's like, whoa, that's my stuff. And she sues me. The courts are going to be like, yeah, that's her stuff. Right? So, like, there's, like, you know what I mean? Right, not necessarily. That's right. You don't know. But you're taking a risk, right? Right. Like, sometimes I'll say to somebody, you know, if you see it on the internet, don't make a paper trail and don't buy the pattern that you're going to copy. Exactly. (laughs) Some quilters, like, that have a pattern. I'm one of these quilters that I I don't need a pattern. Right. But I sketch out my quilts. Like, we have an Omicron Modern Challenge right now going Uh on in So I sit there and I sketch it out. And out of habit, being the artist... I write the date I get. <laughs> That's right. I keep saying, right, exactly. Exactly, exactly. I don't want, if somebody comes up to me, I'm going to enter it, and, you know, if somebody comes up to me, wow, I did the same that's pattern. Right. Okay, but you I want to go. Right, provenance. I did mine, and that's just habit. Right. Even artists. It's good habit. Something, yeah. and sometimes they say, you know, that looks a little bit like this other artist who I know, and but when you see them in person, they don't look yeah. the same when you do a flat photograph on the internet, things can look similar. But I always tell people like, yes, you go to these classes, you learn techniques. And I've taken every like class and everybody comes up with the same stuff. And then you sit there and you go, but how do I make it mine? Yeah. Like Carolyn Woods at Broward Cult Expo. Uh-huh. Years, everybody's cult looked the same. And I go, you know what? I don't want my cult to be the same. Right. Started changing it. So, right. but because. And that's the moment, right? I think that's, that's the moment, moment, you know? Like, and now. Now the, the quilt that I made in her class, because I cut it different on a different angle or I made it into blocks or whatever, yeah. now in mine. That's right. And, and that's it. That's so right. People, I went to the same class and my quilt doesn't look like that. That's I said, right. Exactly. I took step because I just took that one little nugget that was like, oh, I really like this that's part. Right. And then I just applied it where some people, they can't, but everybody keeps saying it. I'm like, are they making the same thing? Are they making all these mon- money? But there are a lot of women that do have businesses and they do have patterns. And you look at them and you're like, gee, like that looks really similar to somebody else. And yeah. are they writing it? Or you know, they don't worry about it because they're just going to keep selling the pattern at nine ninety five as a PDF and yeah. and that's model. And they they don't they don't that's right. you know mind. But there are some like Sublawas that you look at it and you you know it's her. Right, yeah, others and it's like, well, I don't know. That kind of looks like that well, one. And then you've got the, right, and you've got the big problem, which is what I love about your stories is that we have a whole group of things that are are repeating blocks and applique Mm -hmm. and a huge history, a huge volume of stuff. And so just because my quilt looks like your quilt doesn't mean that I copied you. It means that we right. both copied that block that was done in the 1840s. So, right. Right, so you know, it doesn't – that's the other part of this that's so interesting. So when I see pattern – and I really love pattern makers, so I'm not trying to pick on them tonight. But when I see them and they're very upset about somebody is copying my thing, I, you know, my first thing is like, well, who did you copy? Right, like how much of that is original? How much is it just convenient? Like everybody's influ. I like to use right? the word influence. Right, like who influenced you? That's right. And, and right. the math so, isn't protectable, and the directions aren't protectable. The expression is, and you've used, uh, you know, a log cabin that's been done a thousand times. So really, what your pattern is is just something convenient for mostly the beginners who don't know how to do what you're doing, and and recognize that, and don't get so freaked out because. Yours isn't necessarily original either, right? So right. Um, it's just silly, <laughs> you know. I think I think if you're running it really as a business and you have to protect your style and your look and that's your livelihood and you are watching people and you may send out that letter, you know, because you it takes it takes money to go to court. It does. Win, and people don't realize it's not yeah. a cheap thing to it's do. Not, no. So but if you see that somebody is I mean, it's kind of hard, but you know, you, sometimes I go on to some of these and I'm like, oh, they look the same. I'm not worried about it. If somebody, that's the way they make their living, you know, they're not making millions of dollars. No, they're not. But when I see, like I said in the group and they're so concerned about it, I want to say, just enjoy the quilting. That's right. And it's often you sell it for charity, you sell the wine. Right. Just and work with like your brand. I mean, that's the part that I think is so interesting about this. That like, you know, Elizabeth Hartman stuff is very distinct but there are other animals, like literally at um, market one year, there was a booth, like a few mu- few uh, stalls away that it was like, it looked like her stuff, right? She doesn't have a lock on that look, but 
people are going to buy her stuff because they love her name, her brand, her all of that. So build up your brand so that people aren't going to be going to your the people. That's that's the part. Like let them say, oh, I just love yeah. the directions and I love their look and I want to support them. Um, work on that and not be so – I mean, send the cease and desist letter if you want or whatever. Do whatever – that part. But, like, work on your own stuff. Don't be so concerned about – you know, the other things. I mean, obviously, you sometimes you go to court. And sometimes, but the other part that I think is so interesting. So you get me at the end of the day where I'm like way too like, okay, I'm just like. Um, we could do a part two. <laughs> exactly. In the morning and I'll be more reserved. Um, I think the other part is interesting is how few pattern makers are registering their works, including people that are incredibly famous. So we did Jen Kingwell as a sew along, and we had all this brouhaha about like, should we be, should we have to get permission from her? Which we did not. We don't need permission to do a sew along from her. We weren't making any money off the books. We were telling people right. to go buy the book, right? It, to be part of our little group, you had to say yes, I bought the book, um, so okay. which we didn't even have to do, right? And we were teaching pe- very big. We were teaching my law student Corey how to sew quilt for the first time and making videos with one of our quilting ladies so it was like how do you make a square in a square right we weren't saying like you know make seven of these right we were literally <laughs> teaching super basic stuff <laughs> um Jen Kingwell hasn't registered that pattern the gypsy wife quilt pattern isn't registered with the U.S. Copyright Office which Maybe seems she to me doesn't feel it's necessary. right and she might not feel it's necessary but what I found so interesting about it, like this is a pattern that's extraordinarily popular, right? She's sold many of them. She knows how to run her business. I'm not saying that she doesn't. But a lot of people, there was a community kind of way supportive of her. But in the sort of legal side of it, I was like, well, she hasn't registered her work. Like anything that we're doing, like, you know, it just was really interesting from the copyright side of it. Because it was like all the stuff that you were saying, like, if we were really being bad actors, which we were not, we were not being, we were good citizens, um, she wouldn't have been able to get any damages from us anyway until she registered that work. And that's when the clock started ticking. And so I found that really interesting that somebody, like, it doesn't, it's only like 35 to $55 to register that thing. You know what I mean? Like, so it right. just seemed to me really interesting, at, like what you're saying. And they, and I get, it's to say nothing against her, but it was the right. whole system isn't relying but, on copyright. But you the know? thing is for her. Yeah. If I, if I became a pattern designer yeah. and I would probably do the same thing, not file until I have to. Yeah. But if I'm getting on in my years, I would start copywriting them because then I would want my estate to have it. That's right. Or my children to that's have right. an income source for my corporate right. that's and right. that's that's a different thing that that's people a different thing that's understand right. that you have this body of work and that's you have right. all these things or maybe you trademarked a name i always get confused between copyright and yeah, trademark, okay. right. trademark, trademark a name. that's right right so that that is something that is part of your estate and that okay. it has value after you're gone so if you you have children and you have just want a quilt i don't know if the yeah. tulane or you do but yeah. you may say, but I created this and I right. want to make sure that it's it's trademark and that it's copyrighted and that right. it's protected so that my child may want to have it or may want to license it out. Right. So if there's that, value there that you that's sorry. that's how you create the value is yeah. in in the government systems that we have, trademark, copyright. Like right. if you were to sell your business, I suspect you would trademark the name very quickly Absolutely. so that you yeah. would be able to sell that brand. Right? Exactly. All right. So right. Two, okay, it's all so, about money. It's all about money. <laughs> it all is the whole thing is about money. Yeah. <laughs> money and a little bit French uh, right of attribution. People care about being named. So our yeah. the, the our system doesn't care that much, the U.S. system. But we all do see, like, people want to be like, oh, that's Sue's, right? We, we want to be credited with what we're doing. And that super see, seems to be as important as the money to some people, <laughs> you know? Like artists, a lot of artists have teams of people that do their work now, very famous artists. Right. So the question is, is you can have... 40 artists producing your work like Jeff Koons right, with yeah, accreditation right. and he didn't even touch it. So That's do right. they, as from the studio of Jeff Koons? No, he doesn't. So, right. you know, work for send, hire. I That's right. send my work. Right. And those right. kind of things become like in the art world, the studio system is very common where you don't do it. But in the quilting world, it's like, if I entered a quilt, but somebody else quilted it, right. I would have them attached to it. But yeah. do they cash price too? Do we split right. it? Exactly. Just that as right. well. So, that's a little, you know, those those things come up because right. the, the art world is used to the studio system right. and the quilt kind of visit, not, but right. the modern quilt right. guild, which is kind of like the modern art guild now, right. but, you know, those kind of things. But I do feel if you run your business, just regular 
business for yeah. any part of your estate planning is you do go. And like I said, I have a sketchbook, even everything. And I, out of habit, I write yeah. that on my sketch Provenance, and date it because you, you make even if I want to go back, I want to say, oh my God, I made that like five years ago. Right. And everybody's making an Amish type cult now. Right. Boy, it was my time. But it's part of my art archive. Yeah. Maybe one famous and then, you know, right. and would have all this and can go sell it and get some money. That's right. <laughs> Well, it's so interesting, isn't it? So I think provenance, this, these are the things I think are important to people after two years of like immersing. <coughs> provenance is really important. Knowing where things come from, tracking mm-hmm. it, because you don't know what you're going to end up doing with it. So keeping, as you said, a notebook of where the, what the fabric is, where the, pat, where the idea came from, just so that when you entered into that quilt show, you can say, this is my own work or... I looked at, uh, you know, Marie Webster images from the 30s or whatever it is. Like, just keep a good Documentation is really important. Documentation. The other thing is copyright. I think if you care about your work, you register your works. And we're trying to figure out a way to teach people how to do it. It doesn't have to be expensive. You could even do it once a year. There's lots of ways to do it. But show you're serious so that when you send that cease and desist letter, so or you do a notice and takedown, you can back it up. So if you send a notice just to, like, let's say, I don't know, Macy's takes your work <laughs> and uses it, and you send them a cease and desist letter, or you do a notice and take down to take it off, you've got 10 days before you have to file it into court in, a certain, in certain scenarios. And if you haven't registered your work, you can't do that. So if you really... Or maybe they'll be, say, how big of a check do I have to write you to keep it on the website? <laughs> that's right. Exactly. But they're going to be more serious. I yeah. mean, you can do a fast track and register the work, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. It's going to cost you like $800, right? But if you register like a whole bunch of work, $35, $55 for the year, you know that you, you work and do it on a regular basis. Like every, you know, January 1st, you bundle that's it all idea. up and you send it into the copyright office and you don't have to worry. Your unpublished works, your published works, sort of send them in. And there's lots of ways to do that. So that's my, use the copyright system. The studios do, the publishers do. Why aren't you, if you really care about your work, that then I think you should show it by having the registration record. And all of the all of the quilt publishers do. Okay, that's my other one. Then trademark. I think that trademark has become really important for even teeny tiny businesses because of hashtags. So mm-hmm. if you ha- – and you've had that example of the Lady Lash versus Lash Lady. Mm-hmm. If you had the reg- – if – if you have the regist- if you have the trademark, you have more power to go after people using it inappropriately. And yeah. and the other it thing is it costs money. That's the problem. It does, but oh, because we are working on a DIY system so that you can re- you can learn how to do your own trademark work, and it costs you between two and four hundred dollars if you just do the government fees. And we've already mm-hmm. been doing it. We've done it. Uh, we've done it once, and we're going to try to do it three more times to see how it getting it all the way through the system and if you do it pro se with no attorney they're very gentle the trademark because we did it like not as we were like we're not attorneys we don't know what we're doing um, i've done and, it before i know how to do the search and how you right, do it right and do the form and then we came back and we had a yeah. uh, typo and they're like just put this in and it will be fine they're very gentle with the people that don't have attorneys right um they're walking you through it and so what does it do think about it like a little shop Right, you have like, we have a little shop called Misa Me here, and, and they are doing. They have international people coming to their shop now. They're on the website. They don't want some other shop call, be calling Misa Me someplace else in the U.S. Right? right? They want that thing. And then with the hashtags, we want. So you say, um, just want a quilt is a good example. So just mm-hmm. want a quilt is our brand, right? We're building this brand that we have no product. It's hysterical. It's the most ridiculous. It's so well, Nike. Well, it's Facebook right? and they're a brand and they have no products. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> or, any, or Google. Right, exactly. Or so we are just like a thing. We're like, we're a goofy thing. Anyway, but if people say just want to quilt and they just want to put that hashtag just want to quilt because they just want to quilt, totally mm-hmm. fine. But if a company uses it, let's say Moda picks it up and puts just want a quilt, Moda, or whatever, we're like, wait, that's our registered trademark. You need to stop, right? And so that gives, and with trademark, so if you're using it as a, you know, if you're using it as your brand, as your hashtag, as opposed to just a descriptive term, 
if you don't have it registered, you can't fight it. And we've seen yeah. examples of that um, quite a bit. We've had a number of people come to us with this, and this is a new thing, right? That you you want to identify, you want that as a source identifier, not just as a descriptive term. So I, I think that there are certain things that people can do that are not very expensive. Um, and if you're building a brand that is that important to you, spend the 220 bucks to register yeah. the work. And I, I really don't understand why attorneys, I mean, I think that it's just because there hasn't been these alternatives. Um, it shouldn't cost $1,500 to register a work. And you don't have to do all these classes because if you register it in one class, nobody else is going to want to use it. If you got the domain name right. and like at least one of the classes, you're kind of covered because like who's going to, who's going to, Who's going to use your, you know what I mean? Like, they're not going to be like, oh, well, you know, I'm going to use it for scissors because they didn't do and it. And a lot of times once you, know? you register in the one class name, yeah. when somebody does their search, the attorney is going to say, don't do it. Because exactly. if you don't, right. it's it, right. likely they'll start owning others. That's so right. you, because I That's had right. that and the attorney's like, listen, yeah, don't do it. You know, they That's own right. it in, in exactly. education. Yeah. It doesn't matter. They took the time, pick a different name. That's and right. That, and so, I think yeah. the thing that about that is so interesting is that, um, you know, there's a thing called bridging the gap. And so we know that, like, I mean, that was the, the Levi case. So a fancy uh, a fancy company put the, like, Levi thing on their jeans, and they said, well, we're in the fancy market, and Levi's is in the not fancy market. And the court said, well, there's no reason why they couldn't be in the fancy market, right? So there's a notion of bridging the gap, that just because you're selling, I don't know, right. uh, lipstick today doesn't mean you might not do eyeshadow the next day, well, my, right? Mine was the same thing because she was selling in a high-priced – department store and I was selling at a mass merchant but it didn't matter and I lost that case because right they, they could right right it could right. or she could, whatever yeah, you know that's right Bridging the gap. Back to, yeah the that's perception right. but I do know the first day I was in jeans it was like that little red tag and that seagull that's back right to- <laughs> Like, that's no, right don't even make I know that case I have probably taught that case 35 times I know that case I didn't even know there was a case I just yeah. knew <laughs> it's really I think FIT, well FIT kind of taught you like how to you know about knocking off and pattern right. tracing stuff, but it was kind right. of even where it's like you don't do that you don't touch the alligator you don't touch the right red. exactly <laughs> right don't don't use Dr. Seuss don't you know there's certain things you don't do don't sue don't use JD Salinger they'll sue like crazy Right. Know who's going to really? sue. Is this, yeah. Right. Yeah, they have well, three cases. People like, like, like that go after, like we said, I could never use certain numbers. I think every yeah, number is that's right. because of every sports fan. But if I did a three or a 23 on a girl's thing, but it had a soccer ball, I could probably be okay. So, <laughs> that's right. That's Public that perception. Like, um, it's some, so people, great. some people, some people copyright uh, trademark words, you know, mm-hmm. and then, but they don't always enforce them. Okay. But, so, we are already an hour, but I have one more. I want to. I want your opinion on this last thing, and I'll let you go if that's cool. Um, so we are now working. Okay, this is very odd. So I went to the library, which was a very exciting thing. So I went to the public library with my kid, um, and uh, I was looking, and they have all these books. Like I know they're a library. I know it's a really surprising thing that the library had a lot of books, but they're buying like at least our library all the current um, quilt books that are there like all of them Angela Walters Tula Pink like all of them they're buying all of them and so you know I started to think about like well what can I do with that book if I check it out like can I make a copy of it can I not sort of like what what role does li- do libraries play in our world right now and then someone on our Facebook page said well my guild has a library and I thought oh wow I hadn't thought about that because there's all these special rules for libraries so I asked my library friend today very famous uh, library copyright guy I'm like do you think a guild counts for 108 which are library exceptions if they have a library and he said yes so that's really interesting as long as they're allowed they they have one thing they have to do they have to let people uh, other researchers use their collection if somebody asks them right you have to be you have, so to like make you have, a, you have a mini lending library exactly now. right so if I was like at another guild or a, a, a scholar or somebody and I said would you have this particular book and you did you'd have to let me use it but that means that there's all kinds of preservation copying and there's reproduction distribution and there's, you know, you can, I mean, you still can't, you still have to use fair use, but there's a lot of things libraries can do with books. Um, and so, you know, I was kind of surprised at how people responded to it because they were like, you are not allowed to copy a book. And it's like, that's true. You're not allowed to go to Stephen King and like come home and make a full copy of the Stephen King book. <laughs> But, when we were in college, we would use the copy machine to copy stuff out of our textbooks. Exactly, right? I don't see how that's any different. 
if I like take a take something and I make a copy of I want that particular now if I take it and I copy the entire book that's market replacement that's not cool that's being a bad citizen right go buy the book and it's going to be just as expensive to make the stupid copy at Kinko's and Kinko's is not going to let you do it anyway Um, but if I do like one you know some books require you to copy it like paper piecing and some some books I just want that one pattern so I I copy it I I don't know I mean for me personally I think I'm okay with that you know but people kind of I'm okay with that if if there's a, a book and somebody you want to copy that one thing and you're using it for personal use um, yeah. it's, it's Prince library. You know, I have, I have books. Sometimes I buy, um, books online, use books. Cause I'm looking for like, I'm trying to make an archive of Florida quilts. Uh-huh. So I'm always on Amazon looking and I have like my own little library and they're, ex- they're old library books that right. somebody that's right. that they got rid of. Right. That's right. But if I'm taking something out of it, it's because I'm making either a lecture or a ref- referencing it. And right. it's, it's my library. It's I mean, I'm a library. That's right tons of art books it's my art archive we that's call right. it an artist org yeah. um it's my references um that's right um but i'm not i think everybody has something like that but i'm not doing it for for profit i'm not saying you know like burt's bees he found this old book in a barn and that's how burt's bees came about he copied all recipes out of yeah. this book from like 1820s 1800s or something so the question is is like well that person's probably dead i don't know if yeah. it was handwritten or produced but you know, it goes back to the same thing. It's just somebody out there that's watching that's going to enforce it. So if that person, if that book or that book author isn't around anymore, you know, unless her estate is going to go after it. I mean, I think we all we all have to be ethical. We yeah. all know like, oh, I'm going to copy this out of this book because I really like this pattern and the book isn't in print anymore. Right. And it's only available at the library and so be it. Yeah. You know, I have my part. I support my library. And those right. little things, the library is supposed to be used as it's a, it's reference, it's enjoyable. It, that's what we use it for. Right. And that's, you know, they have the responsibility of whatever their historical, whatever they need to do. They right. take books out of certain, they put stuff in. But the, pur- the purpose where you go to the library is like, so I don't have to buy the book. Well, it's and also, the I mean, I think that really something really important to sort of keep in mind, at least from my perspective, is that, okay, I hadn't been in a public library for I mean I was one I was in one for this so I've been to, to twice in like and then the last time was my kid was like five years old right so like I haven't I don't story spend time. a lot right story time um but that's a, there's a lot of cultures that they don't have the money to buy a bazillion books and like they I mean it by keeping them from saying oh well you're not allowed to copy that for your personal use you're also it's a it's a democracy thing right like 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 it says oh well if you can afford to buy the thirty dollar book then you could go ahead and make it. But if you are checking no. the book out of the library and you want to make a copy of that particular pattern and then return it so when someone else can use it, that's not cool. And I think that that's the essence of a library is the democracy of education, right? That and you don't have to phys- you don't have to be wealthy to buy- to be able to read a book or to use well, a book. But my library, you can download a book off the internet. That's right. From my library. Hugely. You even come to the airport and you're laid over at Fort Lauderdale Airport. You have access to that. That's right. And it and it, it's good for, for two weeks and then it expires, it goes away, which That's means right. I'm assuming that the library has some sort of budget that they purchase so Huge many. amounts. And all of these publishers, they're, the publishers right. are not making them, they're not, so look, at the publishers are making money off those libraries like crazy. If you screen capture yes. a couple of pages from the book before before you, you know, it expires, does that publisher care? No, they already got their money no. from the library. Right? Get their money. So I think it's the same yeah. thing. Like somebody purchased that book, and now you're going to to use it. And I think yeah. libraries are important since I I'm friends with my library group, and I used to be vice president of my library. Yeah, you care, right? Most of the people, like even me. I mean, I still use the library. Yeah. Um, I, I think it's. I don't. I think that we sometimes we overthink too much. And yes, yeah, there's some will say because we're a very litigious society, and somebody's going to say, "Well." you know, you are holding quilting books now and people are copying out of it. I mean, that's, that's like right. really extreme. I think that um, right. libraries are important for the community. Huge I think thing. it's education. Yeah. I think it's something people forget that we have and they're very important institutions. Yeah. And the most people I know are my librarians. They're better than Google yeah. at my local library. And um, I think that um, we just sometimes overthink things all the time. So if right, I went right. into the library and I took out 
um, and I've done it and I was doing my research on my Amish quilt and I took out my books and then I saw one, I scanned it into my computer and then I ended up cutting it up the pattern because I needed to make it modern. I didn't think of anything as my personal no. use. Okay, I so, my library dues or whatever. Yeah. I return the book. Return and the book. That's right. That's it. So you know, I was I was fine with it. I'm on the <laughs> so when I was a grad student, um, I would I was doing World War One and I get all these books interlibrary loan and I'd have to return them very quickly, right? So they would come in. They were from like the eighteen you know eighteen twenty I mean nineteen twenty three or whatever nineteen twenty six. And I took it to Kinko's and they would not let me because of a lawsuit. I couldn't make a copy of it, even though some of them were in the public domain and some weren't. And they mm-hmm. were like, no, you can't. So, of course, I'm a bit feisty. Um, I <laughs> bought a, a copy machine. So I had a copy machine in my bedroom when I was a grad student so that I could photocopy all the books I needed to do. And, you know, it was, again, my I think it's totally okay. I was doing it. Now, now you can just use your iPhone to do exactly. it. Exactly. <laughs> totally. But the other thing is that, like, having made copies of books, a lot of copies of books, like a lot, a lot, you don't, like – Look, you're going to have someone like me that's going to do that whether it's legal or not, right? Like I was – I hadn't been to law school. I wasn't thinking about the law. But also like that's a lot of work. And then also mm-hmm. like I may or may not use it. You wouldn't have got the sale from me anyway. I mean I was buying books right. when I could buy them but these weren't available. So I mean I think that you have to think about You're it. You're the, the one off. Yeah. The and then you know like <laughs> I bought tons. I mean you should see our – we have tons of books, right? We buy lots and lots of books. But – I don't know. I just think that people do overthink it. I think that there are super fans like me that I wanted every single book on World War One ever, 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 and I'm going to do everything to get them. Um, and then there's some people who can't afford it, and some people who are just going to figure out ways to get around the system, and that's okay because every industry understands that, right? Yes. You know, it's mm-hmm. just not the cost of doing business. It doesn't. Nobody cares, yes. right? I mean, we yeah. want to be good citizens, but that's sort of my thought. So, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> Oh my gosh, this has been like so fantastic. I just think you're so cool. I love your comments. I love your stories. I just, I want to spend time with you. I just think you're awesome. We didn't even get to like other I things. To, you I'll know? tell my husband I have a super fan. You do have a super fan. I am your super fan. That's why I was mortified when I forgot. I was like, no. Well, That's it's terrible. Okay. Don't worry about it. We all oh have these lives. I, I, I'm president of my quilt guild and I'm yeah. the chair of the Broward Quilt Expo, yeah. which is a biannual event. Yeah. So I'm like, Dated. And then they say, well, do you make any quilts? I go, no, I'm too busy running everything that I right. don't even have to sit and sew. So tomorrow is our sew day. Oh, and nice. I, I'm going to show up and actually sew tomorrow. That sounds really nice. you got to force yourself to do that. Otherwise, the world yeah. takes over. And you really just want to quilt, right? <laughs> You're just like, yeah, leave me alone. Like, because the sound of the sew. And I every time yeah. there's, there's something that happens, I always win a sewing machine. So I yeah. won a Brita. I won every – and they go – you win all the machines. And I'm like, yeah, I buy like $40 worth of raffle tickets. I put it all in the one thing. So my husband, every time he goes, how many sewing machines do you have? I'm like, they're in the garage now. And he goes, why? I go, I keep winning them. <laughs> <laughs> I like that. The strategy. And, we'll have to I have you on. Them. And That's the only great. one that I use mostly is the one I actually bought like years ago. So <laughs> That's so great. I love it. Well, I really uh, yeah. appreciate your time tonight. It's so anytime. cool. Welcome anytime. Um, when we get our little trademark thing, I, I'm going to have to send it to you and see what you think because I are, uh, we are sort of making a package that we're hoping that will help people um, sort of think about it and, and it would be fun to see what you think of it since you've been so immersed in everything. Yeah, but tell them it should be part of their estate planning. That's an estate important planning. thing. That's right. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. I hope, I'm glad the hurricane didn't uh, hit you. Yeah, not this one, but I know there's another one brewing, but thank you. And I hope you don't get any hurricanes either because you're in... You're in hurricane zone also. <laughs> yes, we are, and it's not fun. Nobody wants to evacuate. It's not fun. It is no, not fun. It's, yeah, no. The only thing is, is Florida is a peninsula, and it takes a long time to evacuate. Yeah. I don't know you evacuate, too, out of the Yeah, we Gulf. went to Hattiesburg or, or uh, Tuscaloosa, so. Yeah, so terrible. for us, it's really, really hard because yeah. we're, we can get hit from any anyway. But it's terrible. You're like yeah, an island. It's, it's kind of weird, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're a peninsula. Right. I think we're Smith, but I'm not sure yeah. exactly. I think we're a peninsula, but yeah, it's really hard. But I always tell people that, like I said, we're we're ground zero for um, for climate change because everything everything really hits us. And I've been here 25 plus years, and I've seen the hotter summers, and I've seen the change in weather patterns, and I see more algae bloom, and I see things that don't exist anymore or do exist. It's you know, when you start becoming aware of it, you're like, wow, like, 
this, I never thought in my life, I'm, I'm almost going to be 60. So I'm like, wow, I've seen so much happen in my lifetime where I don't think my parents have the same climate diversity in their lifetime in the same range. And yeah. to see how much of it, it's very scary. Yeah, it is. It really is. But we do use quilts in Florida. Even though I'm in South Florida and it's always 95 degrees, we live in air conditioning. So people always- right. It's always cold. Are, <laughs> it's always like, cold. Yeah, yeah, cold. It's not cold down here. I'm like, yes, it is. We it's always cold. Right. I get it. Yes. <laughs> Right. Bundle up to go to a restaurant. Exactly. That's right. You'd have to wear a sweater to go to the supermarket. Exactly. <laughs> well, I adore you. Uh, do you need to review this before we post it? Or are you cool with no, what we talked about? No, you can about? go ahead. I, you edit whatever you need to do. It's Not a problem. If you want to revisit? Sure. All right. You know, I'll see you in the Facebook group. <laughs> totally. Uh, and when we get further on, I would love for you to see and chat with you more about what we're thinking about because you've been so on the front lines. I'm really curious about... You know, there's a, a few core people that I really, um, I'd like you to see it before others do. I think it would sure, be Sure, really cool. I'd be honored. Awesome. All right. All right, fabulous. Awesome. Take care. Right, have a have good, a night. good night. Bye. Bye. So you've been listening to Just Want a Quilt, a research podcast coming out of Tulane University Law School. And I'm Elizabeth Townsend Gar. If you like this podcast, keep listening. Also, we have a Facebook group. Come join us. We talk about a lot of things. We also have an Instagram account. And of course, most importantly, I really hope you get a chance to quilt today.